He didn't entice men with his own words, but it was through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now today we're going to move on and look at the church in a little bit more detail. We're going to look at the formation of the church. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 38, if someone would please read that, Acts 7 and 38. This is he that was spoken in the church in the wilderness of the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and had our fathers who received the lovely oracles to give unto us. So the church in the wilderness which the angel which spake with him to him in the Mount Sinai, speaking of Moses, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So when we look at the church in the wilderness, we see exactly what is going on, even with the present day church, or what is meant. Just what we talked about with the word Ecclesia. When Israel came out of Egypt, there was supposed to be a separation from them in the world. We all know that they had trouble with that throughout their entire history, but that was the whole purpose. Why were they the church in the wilderness? Because it's pointing to a time when God called his people out of the world, and they were supposed to remain separate. Now, if you look in your notes under point I, introduction, there's a lot of notes under there. And I say that sarcastically because I got tied up with everything else and ran out of space for printing. I try to keep it limited to two pages for everybody. But really, just as the church in the wilderness was separate from the world, or supposed to be separate from the world, the church as we know of it today is supposed to be separate from the world. The two, while they coexist side by side, they should not be entwined with one another. And there is too much entwining in the day and the age we live. If we look at the very formation of the church in general, everything, everything, and I do say everything, except God had a beginning. And we can go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. And does anybody want to quote that, read it, or? If we go back to Genesis chapter 1, we all know the big verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And if we go to verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. What's going on in these two verses? God's creating something out of nothing. And what are we seeing? Have you ever gone somewhere with somebody, they know there's something important going on in that situation or that event, or maybe even that place geographically? There was one time I went with somebody to the Twin Towers after they fell in New York City, and they just were standing there. And I approached them and I said, do you know what you're looking at? And they said, no, not really. Because really, for the person who's just gazing there, that's the place where the Twin Towers stop. But to the person who knows what's going on, they would have been able to describe and say, oh, you know, there's five buildings that make up the World Trade Center complex as a whole. That's why it takes up so much space. The Twin Towers were only the two, and you can go into more detail. What's the difference? One person knew they were looking at a bunch of rubble. The other person had a little bit more of a handle on what's going on. That's exactly what we have going on in Genesis 1 and 2. We have a little bit more going on when we co-relate it to the church because everything had a beginning but God. The earth, everything we see had a beginning. We see that in Genesis 1 and 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. What was that? God had all the building blocks gathered together for the creation of everything we see. It was just a matter of calling things into existence as they should be. Let the darkness be upon the, uh, not the darkness, but let there be light, you know, let there be a greater light, less light, and we go through the six days of creation. But at the very beginning in verse 2, God has all the building blocks that he needs to make. Almost like somebody who constructed a clay pot or something like that. They may have that lump of clay, they may have the spinning wheel, but it's a matter of the shaping and the molding and getting it how you want it to be. Well, the church also had a formation period. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Matthew 10, 1 through 5. And in Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, the Bible reads, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against 
unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. So the church had a formation period. Anyone who will talk about, teach on the church, discuss church history, no one's going to say that, well, as soon as God gathered the disciples together, that's when the church really formed. Well, no one's going to argue that because Jesus Christ was still with them. And if he would have left the disciples on their own, we all saw what happened after Christ died on the cross, after they've already been with him for three and a half years. You do that when he just called them together, you don't have much of a church. But God, Christ had to work with them. He had to shape them. He had to mold them. He had to talk to them. He had to teach them things. That's why we have parable. Jesus Christ the whole time was basically building and molding his church. He was getting things into place. We know that many times he instructed the disciples because they were unlearned men. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, we know what the Bible states, that when they, the religious leaders came against the disciples, they said that these are unlearned men, but they took notice that they had been with Jesus. Now, if we would read Acts 4, verse 13, just to bring this out, and show I'm not just ruffle, rattling things off the top of my head. Hmm. But in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. And perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. These men didn't have an education. I mean we look at these men and compare them to Paul. Paul was extremely learned. He learned at the feet of the best of the best. Emmanuel. He understood the law. You know those books of the Testament that we kind of don't, Old Testament that we kind of struggle through and don't really want to read? Leviticus, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and you have this law and this law, and thou shalt not, and thou shalt not, and if this happens, so this person, and offer up this offering, and in this case, do this. And man, we don't like to read them, much less study them and understand them, but Paul understood them. Paul studied them. And he learned at the feet of Gamaliel, the best of the best of the best. He was learned. He was part of the top elite of the Jews, part of the Sanhedrin. He was part of that group that said, you know what? Let's offer up Jesus Christ to be crucified. Not necessarily in the group, but he was part of that Sanhedrin that met by night to try Jesus. He was part of those that brought accusations against Jesus. Paul wasn't a dummy. But the disciples now, if we start talking about them, they were rough and tough, but man, they didn't know this from that. All they probably knew what to do was maybe along the lines of their trade and maybe a basic education. And the Bible confirms that these were unlearned men. But that's what Jesus chose. So he took these men, and they needed a molding period. They needed to be taught. They needed to be instructed on the things of God and spiritual things. Not that they weren't aware of the offerings because they were Jews. They had to go to the temple just like everybody else and offer up their feasts and their sacrifices. They had to go and do this and go through that for ritual and this and that and the other thing. But when it came to spiritual things, when it came to the things of God, when it came to the mysteries, they had to be instructed. When it came to heaven and hell, they had to be instructed. When it came to paradise, the rich man and Lazarus, they had to be instructed. Why? Because all the while, Jesus was taking them and slowly molding and creating his church. He was forming it. And when we look at Jesus, he taught them several ways. He taught them through parables. We can look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 22 and Luke 18 and verse 1, which we don't have to turn there. We're all aware that Jesus spoke and taught in parables. There's no denying that. We all know that without a shadow of a doubt. He made sure to teach them through clear language. Now that one I do want to read. If someone would please find Mark, Mark 9, 31 and 32. Mark 9, 31 and 32. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that, that saying, and were afraid to ask him. So, even though they didn't understand it, Jesus still told them outright, this is what going to happen. If we recall back previously, in times past, Jesus told them, destroy this temple, in 
three days I'll rise up and I'll raise it up again. What was he speaking of? Well, he was speaking of his death and resurrection. But we don't have Jesus speaking in that language to the disciples at this time that mom just read. But it was clear. It was no different than if I told you I was going to do this. It was right there. But still the disciples couldn't grasp it. So he taught them through spiritual truths. He tried to lay it out as clearly as possible. But he also taught them through hands-on methods as well. He taught them failure in Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 21. I'll go ahead and read that. Matthew 17. Fourteen through twenty-one. Well, Sister Beth is helping me along this morning. Matthew seventeen verses fourteen through twenty-one. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on me for my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And when the disciples, and then came to the disciples, Jesus apart, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mount, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So the disciples learn through a hand on method. They learn by failure. And then what's the best thing to do when somebody fails and you're instructing them and you're teaching them and you're molding them and forming them? Well, the best thing is not to leave them on their own. Why? Each one. That's why you don't leave them on your own. Entertainment. Entertainment. But rather there is that molding period, that building period. Okay, this is where you fail, and this is why you fail. Because it's one thing to know if you fail. We've all failed at things in life. No matter what it was, whether it's a small thing, big thing, hopefully it's not too big thing. But there's also that learning period. I know I've worked about one woman who used to be under me under the photo section. If something went wrong and she messed up and maybe she was on the phone for hours trying to figure out what was going on with the photo equipment, she would call it a learning period. Anytime somebody messed up, it was a learning period because it was that time that, yes, you failed, but what can we go do to go back to correct it so it doesn't happen again? And you get instruction and you get criticism and you get, and when I say criticism, constructive criticism. It's a building up time. So you know what you did wrong, so you can better avoid it next time. And so you have to be more successful in the future. So the disciples had this. They had a hands-on method when it came to spiritual things and learning from Jesus. Yes, they failed. But Jesus also took them aside, as we saw in this passage, and told them why they failed. But along with failure with the hands-on method also comes success. You know, you don't always fail at things, but sometimes you do succeed. And we find that was true with the disciples in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20, and we won't read the whole thing. I want to turn there to make sure I have the thing fresh in my mind because I have a gut feeling I know what I'm referring to. I just want to make sure that I am referring to the right thing before me. Luke 10. Yep. And after these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place, whether he came himself, whether he himself would go. So 
So what did Jesus do in this current passage? He said, all right, guys, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out into every city, lay any hands on the sick, heal them, cast out devils. Those things that you see me do, that's what I want you to do. So he sent them out, and they were successful. And do you remember how they came back? They came back rejoicing. And why were they rejoicing? The devils were subject to them. Pastor, Jesus, we've done this. We did as you said it. We went out. And you know what? We saw the sick healed. We saw the lame walk. We saw the deaf here. And those that, had demon, that were demon possessed, we saw the demons leave. And they are fine. They are living normal lifestyles. They are no longer what they were. They had a hands-on method. Now, Jesus did rebuke them to some degree, and he had to, once again, he had to get them right on the back, right path. Did Jesus want them to go out laying hands on the sick to see them recover? Absolutely. Did he want them to go out and deliver those that were demon or oppressed and possessed? Absolutely. But he had to get their mind right. It's not always a matter of knowing what to do, but it's making sure that our mentality and our heart is in the right place. Because it's one thing for someone to go out and do great and mighty miracles, but if their heart is never in the right place, it's all in vain. And Jesus wanted to make sure that, you know what, no matter what power the Holy Ghost, uh, no matter what way the Holy Ghost uses you, whether it's healing, whether it's speaking, whatever it is, you need to make sure that your rejoicing does not lie in that. That's not why you're doing these things. You're not doing these things for glory or credit, and you're not doing it for any case of shock at all. But rather, you need to remember in everything that the Holy Ghost does through you, that your mindset is focused on the fact that your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. So they learn through failure, they learn through success, and even in those successful times, Jesus Christ was molding them and shaping them and saying, you know what, even in those times, you need to remember this. That's great that that happened. But you also need to remember this aspect. The only reason that these things are so magnificent in the first place is because you should be because your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And how does that affect? Because everything that they did, their mindset, their mentality, everything they learned got passed down from generation to generation. Not that it's not the Holy Ghost dealing and working with us, because He is the one that changed us. But what do we do when we talk about? Um, the foundation of the church, we go back to the early fathers. I mean, when we compare the church, where do we go? And we want to say the church is today is not where it's supposed to be. This isn't God's design. Well, how do we know that? Where's the first place they go? The book of Acts. Why don't they go back to the early 1900? Why don't they go back to the 1800? But no, they always go back to the book of Acts. They go back to the beginning. And from the very beginning, Jesus was giving them instruction and giving the church instruction in the formation that, you know, do great things in my name, but don't rejoice over those things and put all your faith and hope in those things. The first thing you need to make sure, as always, and keep your mind there, is that your name is written down in the last book of life. That's the greatest thing to rejoice over. And how do we know that in today's day and age? Because we can look at the future and know that there are going to be many on that day that say, Lord, have we not done this? And have we not done that? And then it's going to be too late for that teaching method or that time of learning that Jesus Christ is going to bring to the remembrance. You know, it wasn't those great things that you did that you should be rejoicing over. It should be all those great things that you're looking back to. Yes, you did them through the power of the Holy Ghost, but the only important thing that matters is, is your name written in the book of life? That is what it all comes down to. And from the very beginning, Jesus Christ is molding and forming the church. One of the greatest debates is, when did the church begin? When does the time period of the church actually begin? And I'm going for all about asking questions. I'm a white person. This it doesn't work. Well, why doesn't it work? Why is this? How is it supposed to work? What is it supposed to do? One of the greatest reasons probably I don't fit in well at work so much as a company is because... Company doesn't like you to ask questions. I ask questions. Why, 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 why? I want to know. 
It's not that I want to rebel or contradict. I want to know why. Why is this beneficial? Why are we doing this? Does it make sense? And the same thing is true in the Word of God. There's things I study that I often question, why this, why that? And the reality of the matter is, I may never know until I get to heaven unless God tells me before that. But it doesn't hurt to ask why. So in this case, when did the church begin? We'd like to get to the base of some things. Some will say that it began at the cross, just as blood and water came out of the side of Jesus, and Eve was taken from the side of Adam, right there we have the proof that there was the birth of the church at the cross. And it was conceived at the cross, and it was really birthed at Pentecost. And they'll go back and forth, back and forth. But there are sometimes we just have to step back and we gotta say, you know what? The little things don't matter so much. What is the big picture? And when it comes to the debate of when was the church conceived and when was it birthed, Scripture didn't tell us. Scripture doesn't really say to focus on this. But we need to look at the big picture. The big picture is when did the church really begin? Or was it conceived here? Or was it birthed there? But really, what is the church? It is here. We need to focus on it now. Those little things just don't always matter. They're not important to our salvation. And while it's good to know some things, the birth, the conception of the church and the actual birth of the church, I don't think is one of them. Because we can say and argue until we're blue in the face and no one may be right and no one may be wrong. But one thing I can tell you is basically, if we really wanted to argue, we could argue that the church began at the foundations of the world before the earth was even created. Because Jesus Christ was the land slain from the foundation of the world. Not from the point when Adam sinned. Not from when the garden was made, but from the foundation. These things, sometimes they're just not important. And we focus so much on them that we lose sight of the big picture. So let's look at the foundation of the church. So just as in Genesis 1 and 1 and verse 2, God had the beginning of the world and the creation and the, all the building blocks in place. You know, the earth was without form and void. It wasn't the way we see it today. But all the building blocks were there. So God gathered all the building materials together for the church to build the church. And where do you begin with the construction of a building? You don't begin with the roof, but you begin with the foundation. And there is one stone that must be laid in its proper place. Because if it's not laid in its proper place, it's going to throw the entire building off. And if it's not cut just right, it's going to throw the entire building off. Because that one stone alone determines where every other block goes in place in that entire building. And that is the cornerstone. According to Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, the cornerstone is defined as this. A stone forming a part of a corner or an angle in a wall specifically. <coughs> such as a stone laid at a formal ceremony. This stone's placement, and this isn't Merriam-Webster's dictionary here, but this stone placement is crucial because it is the first stone that is laid or placed in a masonry structure and all the other stones will be set in reference to this one stone. So if the sides aren't just cut right, it's going to throw off the angle of the entire foundation of that wall. If it's too high, it may impact other things. And when it comes to us as Americans, the most important, crucial building uh, cornerstone that is probably in history is that of the White House. And that stone, nobody knows if it's still down there or if it's still there. But when the, when the cornerstone of the White House was laid, there was a great old ceremony that took place specifically just for that one stone. Not the second stone, not the fourth stone, but the very first stone. And they took their time, and they took their time measuring and angling it and doing everything that they thought they should to make sure that stone was in the most proper location. Because that stone was crucial. When it comes to the church, the cornerstone is the chief stone. It is the most important stone in the entire structure of the foundation. Because 
if the cornerstone of the church would have been off, the whole church would have been off. Nothing would have came together just right. Angles wouldn't have been just right. Walls might not have been lined up just right. And who is the chief cornerstone of the church? Yeah. Jesus God. Christ. Would someone like to read, please, Psalm 118 and verse 22? Psalm 118 and verse 22. The stone which the builders refused, the stone which the Jews refused, has become the head of the corner. I'm going to read First Peter 2, 6, and 7. Wherefore also it contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which it be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the chief, is made the head of the corner. And we know that speaking of Jesus, there's many other passages there listed in your notes that mention that Christ is the chief cornerstone. After the cornerstone, what comes? All the other building blocks. And what are the other building blocks of the church? If someone would please read Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22. Peter was 
in there. Now there's one more thing that we need to realize. Would someone please read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 and 10. First Corinthians three verses nine and ten. We are laid merged together with God. We are God's sons and we are the God. We are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid a foundation, and another builder buildeth thereon. So that every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So, what did it say concerning the church? We are part of the building. What did he say from then? That we're constantly adding form to that building. I'm going to read 1 Peter 2, and verses 4 and 5. To whom coming, as unto a lightning stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God. So we are part of the church. And if we refer back to that verse that we read in Acts about the mount, the church in the wilderness, it said they are lively oracles. The Bible says in 1 Peter that we are lively stones. We are stones that are helping up the formation of this building that we know as the church. But it doesn't stop there. We are constantly supposed to be building upon that foundation, we're constantly supposed to be being adding to that building and building it up. And it's not enough from the passage that we read. What's the famous passage of Mark chapter 16, verse 15? What does that state? Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We are to keep adding to this building. <clears throat> now, when we look at this, what do we refer to this passage as? The great, the great commission. I just want to share with you some definitions that Merriam-Webster's online dictionary gives concerning the word commission. A formal written warrant granting the power to perform various acts or duties. Is that not what Jesus Christ did? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And these things which I've done shall ye also do, because ye go in my name. Ye shall lay hands on the sick, and ye shall see them recover. You shall cast out demons. It is also, and the list goes on, but this is powerful if you get a hold of it. It's an authorization or a command to act in a prescribed manner or to perform prescribed actions. Did not Jesus Christ command us to go? And did he not authorize us and give us the necessary powers that we need? It is the authority to act for, in behalf of, or in place of another. Is that not also what part of the Great Commission is? Are we not supposed to go out in the name of Jesus? It's not our name. It's not by my own might. It's not by my own power. But it's by through the power of the Holy Ghost. A task or matter entrusted to one as an agent for another. Are we not supposed to be God's hands extended? Are we not supposed to be working for Christ? Are we not supposed to be doing the same things that He done? It is an act of entrusting or giving authority. If only we would get a hold of that and realize that it's not a great suggestion, but it is the Great Commission. We are given the authority of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Ghost to do these things. We are expected to do these things. Christ is not here in his flesh right now that he may go forth into the town of likeness and heal the sick. But he's given us that power. 
He's given us that authority. And even greater than that, he's entrusted us to do that. What, what is something, if you entrust somebody to do something, it's not a maybe they'll do it. But normally, if you entrust somebody to take care of something for you, you know they're going to take care of it. They're not going to be last and days to go about it. They're not, they're not going to be me every time somebody tells me at Walmart, this is your department. And I tell them, no, it's not. It's Walmart's department. But if you want, I'll sell you everything in this place for five bucks just to get out of here. It's mine. And then they laugh and they just walk away and leave me alone. That's not been entrusted to me. I might be there and do my job and take care of what I have to, but those things aren't mine. But the church is ours. Why? Because it's Jesus Christ and he's entrusted it to us while he's been gone. And he expects us, us to act on his behalf and to go out and win the lost at any cost, to perform miracles, signs and wonders shall follow them that believe. And entrustment is something that you're placing on somebody else that you know that they're going to take it care of it no matter what. It's in good hands. If I let you borrow something of mine, I can promise you the only way you're borrowing something of mine is if I know you're going to take care of it, especially if it's something valuable. I'm not just going to let anybody handle that. Because it's too valuable. But the church is extremely valuable. But yet Christ has entrusted it to us. What are we doing to build, keep building on to the church of Jesus Christ? It has already been formed. The cornerstone has already been set. The foundation has already been laid by the apostles and the prophets. We are the lively stones. And it is our duty and responsibility it has been entrusted with us to build up the walls of the church. Anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add at this point in time? If not, let's bow our heads and we'll prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke any attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, make himself visible if he so chooses. I pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds will be plowed, Lord, that we may receive your word with gladness, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that it will take root in our hearts, that we may apply to our lives and be transformed to your very image. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus.